Dr. Brennan Spiegel is the Director of Health Services Research at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he directs the Center for Outcomes Research and Education, which maintains one of the largest and most widely cited therapeutic virtual reality programs in the world. Dr. Spiegel is also Professor of Medicine and Public Health at UCLA. He wrote Acing the GI Boards, but he's on the show today to discuss VRX, how virtual therapeutics will revolutionize medicine. Dr. Spiegel shows how a simple VR headset lets hospitalized patients escape the four walls of their isolated room to visit Icelandic fjords, empowers patients with schizophrenia to confront the demons in their head, offers dementia patients a new way to regain function in a life-size virtual town, and enables burn patients to manage their pain by traversing snowy virtual landscapes. Scientists are starting to uncover the surprising benefits, and in the not-so-far-in-the-future we may have doctors specializing in virtual medicine, which will then have its own acing the VR board's review exam. In an unexpected way, VR is also strengthening the humanity in healthcare. Vivid simulations of patients' experience can make us more empathetic. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. Those on this podcast accept no liability for the outcomes of medical decisions based on this information. As the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice, and this does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. If you have a medical problem, seek medical attention. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Brendan Spiegel, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. So we'll start with a little levity. So you're a gastroenterologist, and you also have this particular interest in virtual reality. So my natural first question is, what was it like the first time you did a virtual reality colonoscopy? Was there was there haptic feedback there? What did, what did it feel like? And I would imagine the noises would be interesting. You know, you could hear the, the borborygmy up close. What was that like? Well, it's interesting because simulation is a big deal with VR and actually colonoscopic simulation, uh, virtual colonoscopies go back over decades now. When I was a fellow uh, in you know, 1998, 2000 range, I was learning to do colonoscopy with a simulation, didn't have a headset on my face. Uh, I've also recently undergone a colonoscopy, wide awake, no sedation. Uh, wasn't so bad, by the way, but um, yeah. Uh, I have not recently done, I've only done real colonoscopies instead of virtual ones recently. Was there any particular reason why you chose to do it without sedation? Was it for like one of your trainees just to make sure that they were really paying attention (laughs) to what they were doing? Actually, it was a colleague of mine who was probably would have rather had me asleep than awake uh, commenting on how to manage the polyp or whatever. No, I wanted to see what it was like. And it was really, for me, propofol would have been a waste. It was was, uh, not a big deal. Huh. So you yeah. could just like, pull your pants up and go right back to That's work. That's right. I want to get back to work. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I had I had an umbilical hernia repaired when I was uh, chief resident, and I had it done on uh, Friday afternoon and then uh, was back to work on, on Monday. I assume uh, you didn't do that one awake. That was not, no, that was under anesthesia. But, but yeah, our, our dedication to our craft sometimes. That's right. Okay, so most of what I know about VR, uh, aside from what I've heard you talk about, I learned from The Lawnmower Man, right? The Stephen King book turned movie. So so my questions naturally turn to like c- potential complications of virtual reality. Like, have you ever accidentally or even intentionally uploaded someone's consciousness, right? Has that ever happened in virtual reality? So they're suddenly the patient's just gone. They've been virtually uploaded. Well, first of all, That was one of the worst movies of all time, uh, Lawnmower Man. And I'm pretty sure, if I recall, Stephen King sued them for even putting his name on it. Because it very little to do with his his book. Uh, But that's another story altogether. Maybe check that out sometime. Uh, No, I have not downloaded or uploaded anyone's consciousness yet. And I think it sort of brings up lots of myths and and misconceptions about VR and and what is it and how does it work. Um, And, you know, is this some kind of... uh, you know, weird hypnotherapeutic tricks that we're playing on people. And, and in fact, you know, it's sort of, I guess the question's a little lighthearted, but we do have patients who wonder like, are you doing some kind of mind experiment on me? What, what is this all about using virtual reality? No, Um, that's not, that's social media. 
that's not <laughs> well, that's, virtual that's reality true. isn't there yet. That's true. It's not. <laughs> So, uh, no, I haven't downloaded anyone's consciousness yet. I wouldn't know how to, because I'd have to understand what consciousness is in the first place. Uh, yeah. I was a philosophy major, so I spent a lot of years trying to figure that out. Never quite figured it out. Yeah, I guess that's what they talk about with, with regards to AI, how we, don't, we can't create something sentient when we don't even know what that even means. That's right. Yeah. Right. So you brought up a, a good point. So how do we even define VR? Like, what, what is VR as opposed to either AR, right, augmented reality, or just a 360 degree screen where you can like, like the panoramic view on your, on your iPhone, like what makes VR distinct? Does, do there have to be haptics? What, what makes it distinct from those other modalities and something true VR? Yeah. So when most people think of VR, you know, just sort of consumers, first of all, they're thinking about kind of a gaming platform, maybe you know, teenagers like in their parents' basement playing first-person shooter games. Uh, and it is all that, but it's certainly a lot more than that. But VR technically means that you're in a computer-generated world or environment that's three-dimensional, um, and you can interact with it. So technically, you should be able to interact with elements of that world. Haptics may be part of it or other types of biofeedback. Now, some people um, have a broader definition of VR. Like if you're in a 360-degree video, and you're just sitting on a beach in Hawaii or swimming with dolphins or whatever it is, technically it's not VR unless you can interact in some way. That, dis that distinction doesn't really matter to me. To me, as long as you're in uh, immersed in a three-dimensional world and wherever you look, the gyroscope and the headset changes the view in a sort of perfect one-to-one -one synchrony. So you think that you're in some different world. And that takes, uh, that, that takes advantage of something called presence which is a psychological idea that your brain literally thinks it's in that world, even though intellectually you may know better that, you know, you're not actually on a beach or in a spaceship or whatever, your brain doesn't care. It, it thinks it's there. So you, you mentioned the, you know, the turning your head and the screen is going to turn it proportionally so that you're seeing something different. That makes me think of, you know, I'm an otolaryngologist. So yeah. it makes me think of the, your semicircular canals that, whose job it is to tell you when your head is turning. And so I would imagine at some point there's going to be a mismatch between your actual movement and what the screen is, is telling you, right? Like I, I remember going on a, an amusement park ride. This was as an adult where I think it was Harry Potter and universal where I'm sitting on a broomstick yeah. and the yeah. screen is telling me that I'm moving through space but my ears are telling me that I'm still and that mismatch this is what makes people seasick. This is what makes people car sick. The mismatch between what the eyes are seeing and the ears are feeling. Um, so how do you account for that? Or do you even need to? Because it sounds like what you're saying is, well, as long as you're moving one-to-one, -one, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to. Yeah. It's, it's a great question. And, you know, you think about, you know, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or BPPV where, nothing's moving except this tiny little otolith in your semicircular canals. And you think the whole world is spinning like crazy. And it's this tiny little thing moving around in your inner ear. So even the slightest disconnect, but you know, as you know, the vestibular system and the proprioceptive systems in, in general are so carefully balanced that any tiny deviation from norm, from equilibrium can throw you off. And some people are more uh, subject to that than others. People that get motion sick or get sick on, airplanes or roller coasters may be more apt to get sick in virtual reality. And the issue with virtual reality is if you're moving a lot in VR and if the frame rate of the visuals is low, so kind of a low end processor on the computer side, then what happens is there's a delay between the head movement and the visual field moving. And if there's even a slight delay or latency, that can fool the brain into thinking that it's sort of disconnected from itself. And on the one end, that can cause something called cyber sickness or simulator sickness, which is basically motion sickness. But on the other end, it could actually even trigger a panic attack in the most extreme situations. So it turns out our sense of self, literally the idea that like I have a self and it's yoked to a body is partly governed by the vestibular system itself. And if you throw that off, people can get really disoriented, not just physically, but emotionally. Uh, cognitively. They can literally feel like they're having an out-of-body experience in some cases. 
So I do have a chapter in this new book I've written that we might talk about where I talk a little bit about the science behind that. And that's one of the biggest issues with VR is uh, cyber sickness. Yeah, actually, that's something that we see after you mentioned BBBV. That's something that we see after we treat BBBV. So you do your Epley maneuver, and then ultimately that fatigues the vestibular system. So now it's it doesn't respond as briskly as it did before you treated it for a couple of days. And people will tell you for a few days after their epile, yeah, I didn't feel like myself. I felt like I was in a fog. I didn't feel quite right. You know, this the sensation that they're that they have difficulty putting their finger on. Uh, but ultimately you just warn them that that's going to happen. It passes in a few days and 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 then they're fine, at least for BPPV, right? If you end up with some type of ablative procedure of one of your semicircular canals, then, uh, you know, it can last a whole lot longer, if not indefinitely. So, yeah, that's one of our, our challenges as well in, in the non-virtual world. Yeah. Well, thankfully in VR, when it happens, it's short-lived. Usually, as soon as you take the headset off, it goes away. Yeah. Some people will have a little lasting effect. Uh, about 10% of people had have it at all. And the severe is more like 1% or less in our experience. So what are the types of conditions that we're treating currently with VR? Yeah, so this is really where we start getting into therapeutic options and opportunities. And there's so many, so many ways VR is being used. A lot of the literature focuses on pain management both acute pain and increasingly chronic pain. And we could talk a little bit about pain management if you're interested. Um, But there's other things too, anxiety, depression, administering cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, at home using uh, VR modules uh, with biofeedback. It's being used for schizophrenia, for, uh, for high blood pressure, for dementia and Alzheimer's, eating disorders, the list really goes on and on. It's pretty incredible. It sounds like most of these are diagnoses that would be treated by our psychiatry colleagues. Yeah, although many of them will overlap with medicine and surgery, post-operative pain management. Which well, pain, uh, I mean, that applies to pretty much all yeah, specialties, yeah. right? There's not yeah. a specialty is. that isn't touched by pain, but, but most of the other issues seem to be specific to psychiatry. I'd say so. Uh, certainly, you know, I'm, a, I'm in internal medicine and, you know, of course, we see anxiety, depression, manage it. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome is a condition I see as a gastroenterologist that um, is in a way a brain body disorder. We call it the brain gut axis. And in fact, we use VR for abdominal pain, too. Uh, but yeah, it is a brain focused intervention. You might call it a mind body intervention, which is a little bit more of a, a little less scientific. But it's certainly uh, of interest to therapists and psychiatrists. Well, the gut is the window to the soul, after all. That's right. As we've heard on on this show before. Yeah. So is there a role for combining maybe telemedicine with virtual reality, right? Because of COVID, we've seen this Uh explosion in the utilization of telemedicine. So is there a role for VR with telemedicine? Yeah, for sure. As we know with covid one pandemic has led to another, the second pandemic being the mental health pandemic that we're seeing now, incredible rates of anxiety, depression, suicidality. And there was a shortfall in mental health practitioners before COVID-19. Now that's just been amplified with the mismatch between supply and demand and you know the quarantines that we're now starting to get back into as we go into this next wave. So one thing we're doing right now at our hospital, Cedar sinai as part of a research study is we will actually ship um, a VR headset to patients home. And with it, they get the headset uh, preloaded with a specialized uh, software, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. It's like having a pain psychologist with you at home and they get a workbook that they go through so they can reflect on each day's experience. And some of the time, this is just sort of pure relaxation and distraction, like sitting on a forest and meditating. Other times it's very active where you breathe in and out and the microphone and the headset detects the breathing. And there's through biofeedback, you learn how to breathe life into a dying tree or something like that, um, or learn how to focus your attention on something other than your pain. So these are examples of uh, telemedicine in that we're sending it remotely. Now there are other telemedicine options like uh, being an avatar in a room with your therapist who can be anywhere in the world and you're actually sitting in the same, you know, virtual room and you feel as if you're more connected than perhaps if you're on the phone or looking through a computer screen. Um, but I think the home-based CBT is one example that we're using that's been really uh, very effective. Do you think we could 
have that also for people that are just so need the the contact that they're getting rid of all the COVID protocols, gathering in large groups. We can just give them a bunch of headsets and let them uh, let them go to a cocktail party and breathe virtual breath on each other instead of real breath, and then they get that that socialization out of their system yeah, without I mean, the risk the little, of transmission. Yeah, it's a little fantastical, but it, the technology exists. There are online groups that meet in virtual worlds. You may have seen, you know, Ready Player One, a Steven Spielberg movie. Uh, yeah. It was also a book. Book, yeah. And, you know, the whole, the whole idea there is everyone was living, you know, in this sort of dystopian world where no one was themselves and they were all playing avatars. Uh, that technology exists right now. Um, I think if we talk about good versus evil, that's not necessarily the direction I'd want to go therapeutically. But if used in the right environment with the right people, uh, VR can actually help with loneliness and depression. It can help provide people opportunities to reach out to others in social groups. And there's been a lot of very interesting, unique opportunities to improve mental health in that, in that way. Yeah, I'm thinking of my patients, my older patients with hearing loss. Mm. that especially if they have poor speech discrimination, which means that even if you make it louder, it's still not clear that they're they're having trouble. They can't interact with their grandchildren because their grandchildren are in school. They can't even understand them when they're on the phone because of the distortion that they're so disconnected and so isolated. But, uh, you know, you put them on a, you have them put a virtual headset on and you put some camera or something in their family's living room and you know it can translate have have the have them be able to read what the kids are saying and then they partially feel like they're there it really seems sounds like it would be a great way to to connect with family members that you're otherwise not really safe connecting with yeah we've actually done this in the hospital we've had patients with prolonged hospital stays where we actually give the family a 3d camera and they can live stream the image to the patient who wears a virtual reality headset and can be in the living room or be at the dinner table you know, with their family in three-dimensional space and interact with them. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds that sounds powerful. So for when you're studying virtual reality, how do you study it? Like, what are, what are the controls? Because in some ways, it sounds like you're using it for pain, right? If you're using it for pain control, like during a procedure or, um, or, or say, a delivery, right? Delivering mm-hmm. a baby. Mm-hmm. How do you know it's the immersion of the virtual reality and not just the distraction, right? When it's being studied, how do you do sham VR? Is it like a low fidelity VR? Are you just going to give them a screen, like a tablet with the same perspective? But like, how how is this being studied? How do we know that it's VR? Yeah, that's a great question. There's a few different ways of thinking about the control group from sort of simple to more complex. And we've, we've done the whole gamut. So on the sort of simple end, For example, we did a study in the hospital with 140 patients who were randomized to either a VR library that they had, they get, they got to keep with them at the bedside and use whenever they wanted. It was a specially kind of curated library with, you know, very pleasant environments and uh, relaxation meditation. And the other group got to watch the health and wellness channel on the TV set, which is already being pumped through on a particular channel with meditation. It was a two-dimensional experience. So it wasn't a um, complete placebo. I mean, it was designed specifically to help, you know, support mental health and people hospitalized. But, you know, the VR definitely blew away the TV. It was just much, much more effective. And so you could say, well, you know, maybe that was just a more pronounced distraction. Uh, but the interesting thing is, in many cases, the pain benefit continues even after the headset has come off. And we've looked at 2D versus 3D, and so have others. And it looks like there's like an anesthesia tail that persists as if the brain has been rebooted in some way or temporarily inoculated against pain for some period of time. Now, we're doing a study right now on the higher, a little more sophisticated within the NIH, is an NIH-funded study uh, looking at chronic lower back pain, where we have a sham control. We actually have three arms in that study. One is pure sham. So you put the headset on. So there is a headset. But by sham, we mean it's not three-dimensional. You're looking at a stereoscopic but two-dimensional screen. You're not immersed into a three-dimensional world. It is stereoscopic, but you're not immersed in it. And it's the same relaxation videos that we look that we show in the distraction-based arm, where you're actually immersed and can explore. But then the third arm is this what we call skills-based VR, where we're teaching people skills, cognitive behavioral therapy, executive functioning, breathing, biofeedback. 
And the hope there is, you know, we don't want people living in VR. We want them to learn something about their body and their mind and the connection between mind and body and take that with them in the real world. Uh, so to answer your question, we're actually trying to decompose what is the sort of active ingredient of VR in the study we're doing right now. With regards to uh, active ingredients, is there a minimum effective fidelity, right? Does it, can it be just be immersive pong or does this need to be a believable working world, like a believable looking world? Yeah, it all depends what we're trying to do. I mean, pong um, or something really low fidelity may be sufficient if all you're trying to do is keep somebody distracted during, let's say, a spinal tap or something. Now, there it's a little bit tricky, and there have been spinal tap examples because you can't move your body around an awful lot during a spinal tap. So, yeah. so some of this depends on the situation. Um, but, it's, you know, something pretty low fidelity can be effective. But now the, where the VR we're using now is so, it's so incredible. It's almost like you're on a psychedelic trip in some of these examples where there's just vibrant, fantastical worlds that you're flying through. And when people come out of it, they like forgot that they're in the hospital if they're in the hospital. And, you know, sometimes they're crying tears of joy and you can see they've had some kind of emotional catharsis in there. Uh, I've seen this over and over again. We, you know, we've broken panic attacks in the emergency room using VR. Uh, we've used it during labor and delivery in a randomized control trial. And there's something about the sort of multicolored, fantastical, ethereal, almost psychedelic like feeling of VR that inhibits the default mode network, which is called the DMN. That's the part of the brain that's basically your sense of self, that inner voice that's kind of judging and, and ruminating and babbling to you. If you can inhibit that, which is what magic mushrooms do, which is what psilocybin or psychedelics do, or LSD, cyberdelics can do that too. So we find that the more immersive it is, the more effective it becomes. So there was a study in the book where you compared psilocybin to VR, right? Have there been any studies where they combine the two? Right, either psilocybin or or any other medication. Mm -hmm. Right? Could, would you would there be a role for a medication plus virtual reality? Yeah, like ketamine, for example, which is um, you know obviously available much more widely than psilocybin, which is still an experimental protocol. So yeah, I work with one psychiatrist who actually combines ketamine and virtual reality, and his rationale is that you know like with any psychedelic, there could be a bad trip. And before you start the psychedelic, even ketamine, you want to establish this set and setting. You know, what is it that you're going through? And you want to kind of bring three people through the experience and sort of set it up so that they have a good trip. But it's not easy to do. And some people have a bad experience. But in VR, you can sort of standardize the trip a little bit. So this guy, Omer Liran, he has created these VR environments. And he is a psychiatrist and a computer programmer where he has these beautiful kind of shimmering lakes and you sort of are sitting in under waterfalls and just standardizes the experience. And he has found anecdotally, I haven't yet seen a randomized trial, that uh, when he uses VR with ketamine, he has better clinical outcomes. I would like to see a proper randomized trial. And I'm aware of some groups that are starting to do that work, but I haven't seen one yet. Another study you've mentioned was uh, one on patients with HIV. Yeah. Right. That shows better control of their disease after they've seen a demonstration of how their medication works in virtual reality. Do you recall what the control was that for? Because that's another one that makes me think like, well, couldn't you just show them on an iPad how their medication works? Like, what mm -hmm. is the virtual experience? How is that distinct from just the 2D yeah. demonstration? Yeah. So that study was also by Omer Liran, who's the guy I was just mentioning, by the yeah. way, uh, the psychiatrist. So that was sort of a controlled before and after study. He, uh, each subject was their own controls, I recall, where there was a period of time where they measured adherence with antiretrovirals in these patients with HIV and also measured their viral load and CD4 count, which are nice objective endpoints. Then he administered this VR intervention, which was designed to teach people what happens when they stay on their meds and what happens when they don't. And rather than sort of reading about that in a trifold brochure or watching a video, they flew right into their body. I've actually done it. It's pretty great. And it's this immersive experience where you hit a button with the handset, the hand controller, 
which activates the medication. And you can see how it puts a force field around these um, you know, immune cells and you see the HIV bouncing off. And if you stop for even just a little bit, HIV starts taking over the music changes. And of course it all could be on a video, but there's something about the visceral experience of being inside your body in three dimensions, the sense of presence that VR achieves, that's hard to even understand until you've been through it, that made it more compelling. Now, he did not in that study control, have a control with a versus another approach, but he did show that the CD4 count went up and the viral load went down and adherence went up in the post period, which is pretty impressive. So you've also had that experience yourself where you were inside a a woman's body. Yeah. Actually. And this was a woman who was being verbally and had the potential to be physically abused. Right. Yeah. And that then translates to empathy for others experiencing something like that. Right. Tell, first, tell us a little about that. And also then extrapolate how an experience like that can make us. So rather than just using the VR to treat our patients, treat us help us to be better physicians. Yeah, so um, this guy, Chris Milk, who's sort of a technologist, termed VR the empathy machine. And the idea is that you can stand in the shoes of another and literally feel like you're that person. And that can give you empathy for that person's plight, just through a simulation. And this idea of embodiment, which I talk about in the book a little bit, is uh, this idea that VR can put you physically in somebody else's body. And the example you're describing was at the University of Barcelona. A guy named Mel Slater has a lab out there and I visited him. I did a few crazy things out there, including having a complete out-of-body experience. But this experience you mentioned is an in-body experience where I look in the mirror and I am a woman. I can see myself in the mirror. And as I move, this image in the mirror moves exactly with me. And then I realize, I look around, I'm in an apartment, and all of a sudden some guy comes in. He's this big, tall guy, and I'm fairly tall, but no matter how tall you are, this guy's always taller, because he comes and he looks down on me, and he's yelling at me, he's screaming at me, he takes a telephone, he throws it at me, and I realize, like, I'm about to get my ass kicked. I mean, this guy is abusive physically, emotionally, and it, it just rattled me completely. When I took that headset off, I was like, just so pleased to be back in the real world. And I realized at that moment, like I can't pretend to know what it's like to be the victim of domestic violence, but at least I've experienced a simulation of it. And now when I see, you know, an ICD-10 code or something for domestic violence, which is so easy just to ignore, it, I stop and I think about that experience in Barcelona and I have this different visceral understanding. Again, I can't pretend to know what it's like, but I have a different visceral feeling for that. And I, and I think about it, it stops me in my tracks. And now VR scientists are using that for other things too. Like, what does it feel like to have Alzheimer's disease? You know, what does it feel like to be having a stroke or to have macular degeneration? All of these things are now being simulated in VR. You know, that makes me think of the Stanford prison experiment, right? Where you, you took these students and you put them in a completely different role, right? And then their, their roles ended up dictating their behavior, right? Irrespective of where they were before the experiment. Yeah, the prison guard and but, the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. You make them the prison, prison guard and the prisoner, and then they change, ultimately changed who they were and how they behaved, right? So now we're taking people, we're putting them in VR, but then they're coming back into the real world, Right. So how does that, that seems to contradict. That being said, I think there were lasting effects of the Stanford prison experiment. So that, that this is admittedly a gross oversimplification, but it seems to me like that would, you know, the, your environment in some ways dictates your behavior. And so now you're, you're in VR, but then you're out of VR. So, mm -hmm. you know, is that really what we should expect? right? This, this change in behavior, this change in thought process from maybe a brief foray or maybe a prolonged for, foray into a virtual world. Yeah. Well, there's been quite a few uh, research studies looking at that question. In fact, one from Stanford um, by Jeremy Balenson, who's a professor out there, who's been looking at something called the Proteus effect. And this is sort of this idea of when you see somebody doing a good deed or being heroic, you feel more heroic yourself. And he did this one study where he had people randomized to be sort of the Superman-like character in virtual reality where you could fly around and save 
save a child, I think was the, the scenario versus you're not flying and you have like little power and you can't save this kid. And then the amazing thing is as they walked out of the lab after they were all done, he had a plant. He had a person who, had a, who was walking around with a bunch of pens and dropped them and scattered them all over the floor. And it turned out the people that went through the Superman experience were more likely to bend over and help them pick up the pens off the floor. Whereas the group that felt powerless in VR, they were less likely and they just walked out the room and let this, you know, let this guy pick up his own pens. Now that's just sort of, I don't want to call it silly. I mean, it's interesting, but I think about my own experience that I just described uh, being in this domestic violence simulator. That was three years ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. I mean, I can't say it's completely transformed my life, but to this day, I think about domestic violence a little bit differently, having been through that. I even think about death a little bit differently, having had an out-of-body experience in VR. I died in VR. I floated up to the ceiling. I looked down at my own vacated body. And that is now being used to help with existential anxiety at the end of life, for example. So, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's not like it's a magic wand that changes you forever. But if it's used correctly, it can change cognitions. Are there some people that are more susceptible to it than others? Is it like hypnotism that some people are just so against it that you're never going to hypnotize them and some people that are so susceptible that they're pretty easily hypnotized? Or is it more like social media where we're all like, we're all thinking that we're the ones that can't be manipulated yet we're all actually being manipulated? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's manipulated. I know you're not saying we're manipulating people, but it's... it's um. You know, we all have this intrinsic ability to imagine. I mean, you can think about something pleasant, a pleasant vacation you've been on, but I can't see that. You can sing a song in your head. I can't hear that. So we all live in virtual reality all the time. It's just for people who are sick or in pain or depressed, it can be hard to access that ability to imagine. And what VR is doing, if it's used correctly, is reigniting re that ability to imagine things that can be healing and peaceful. But anyway, you're right that some people are more susceptible to the effects than others. Uh, there is um, something called immersive tendencies, and this can be measured on a questionnaire. And what it means is, you know, some people get more immersed into things than others. Like some people, when they're watching a sports game, you can yell their name and they can't hear you. Or if they're reading a book, they're lost in the book and they can't even think about anything happening around them. And some like people, my kids whenever I call them. Yeah, mine too. Uh, so... <laughs> So, you know, people who have high immersive tendencies tend to get more involved into the VR worlds. And those who have less immersive tendencies sometimes are like nonplussed by the whole experience. Is there a difference between kids and adults? Because, you know, kids, I think, you know, you you talk about how a, we're capitalizing on the plasticity of the brain, right? Yeah. And I think of kids, and I think they are, because they are, kids are so much more plastic than adults, yeah. right? They recover faster, they, they're, they, they can adapt faster. So are you seeing different results with kids than you are with adults? Yeah, yeah. So um, in the book VRX, I talk a bit about this and with kids and, and some of the research and with kids has been really positive, um, you know, helping kids get through painful spinal taps or getting them through all sorts of stressful experiences. But uh, because their brains are still developing, you have to be kind of careful one of the concerns is you can instill false memories. So literally kids will truly believe that they were in that world. Whereas you or I know better. I mean, we know that it was not real. It might've felt real, but we know after the fact I wasn't literally having an out-of-body experience. So we have to be thoughtful about that. Now, some have said that's okay if the alternative is a child remembers a spinal tap. Instead, they remember swimming with dolphins. You know, what's the big deal? And that's, a, you know, maybe an interesting ethical argument. But in general, when kids get to be about 10 years old or older, that goes away. And they're more capable of distinguishing real from virtual. And most pediatricians feel pretty comfortable using VR in those kids. But younger kids would be a little more careful. Yeah, it's interesting you discuss it that way because my kids are little and we're just starting to deal with lying. And what we read about them with when they start lying is they're not necessarily lying because they're trying to deceive you. They're lying because they kind of wish that that had been the way things that they had done things rather than, you know, that they, they're creating a fantasy where that was what happened, where they didn't push their sibling 
mm. uh, rather than the reality, which is that they did push their siblings. So the, mm. the 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 line between fantasy reality in that group and that those kids that are less yeah. than 10 is, is blurred. So now you're literally creating a fantasy for them and putting them in the middle of it. It's not surprising that they wouldn't be able to differentiate between it, even when they, because they can't do it when there's no VR headset on them. Right, right. Yeah. I don't know how that explains adult liars, but uh, <laughs> but that's another story. No, but but like you know, when when you have someone that that uh, you know says, "I saw the crime, and that was definitely them." That was definitely this was definitely the description. You know, people can convince themselves that they saw something or they yeah. experienced something that that didn't actually happen. So we're, right. you know, right. we're facilitating that. Yeah, maybe. You know, we talked about how it could benefit physicians, giving us more empathy. Can it help us with our memory? Because a couple episodes ago, I interviewed Chase DeMarco, who's actually a physician in training, but he's getting his PhD in education, right? In, in, in actually learning how to learn. So we talked to him about the memory palace, where it helps you memorize things by thinking about your own house and you have mm-hmm. your, God, I'm trying to think of just different pathways I had to memorize a physician and as a physi- as a med student and nothing's coming to mind, but you've got right. something on your hat rack. You've got yeah. something on your, on your, on your doorpost. You've got something on your, in your closet door. Fine. It, has that been studied in VR where you can actually you know, be in this virtual house and be, you know, furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide and all the diuretics you need to know, right? That you can just hang them on th- certain things around your house to help you remember. Like, yeah, it's interesting. I'm, a, I'm aware of that memory technique where you just sort of tell ridiculous, bizarre, crazy stories. But it does require that you have a great deal of creativity and that you be able to remember the story uh, in order to, which is an easier thing to remember than presumably the harder thing to remember, which is, it's like a bridge to get you there. Yeah. Um, and I imagine if those crazy stories were rendered visually in three dimensions, you may be even more able to remember those stories uh, viscerally and then recreate whatever the it's mapping to, like the Krebs cycle or glycolysis or whatever the heck, I can't remember anymore. That's just the start of it. All the biochemistry for me. Yeah. But it's interesting, you mentioned the uh, house and, and, um, and memory. And uh, in the book, I talk about a story of a woman with, um, with dementia, so has lost her memory. And this is incredible experience that I saw where a uh, patient is put uh, in a VR headset, this woman with Alzheimer's, and using Google Maps, she's brought back to her childhood home in stereoscopic three dimensions. And you now look as if you're standing there right in front of your home. And all of a sudden, it brings back this flood of memories. And, you know, she's crying and she's telling stories and she's coherent. It's like the VR tapped into these latent memories that she wasn't able to access prior to that moment. And that's called reminiscence therapy, which is, you know, commonly done with with, um, people with dementia. But there's now evidence that VR can really accelerate the ability to reminisce and make it easier to reminisce. So even if you have very little memory on the other end of the spectrum, VR can help you restore some memories. Wow, really great stuff. So is there are there any parting words you'd like for our physician audience? Uh, either something they can look forward to hearing about next in virtual reality, like what you're currently working on, what can, what, what can we expect from the platform in the coming years? The FDA has now named this field. It's, it's considered a new field of medicine. It's called medical extended reality or MXR. And um, there's more and more companies developing digiceuticals, uh, virtual digiceuticals that will be FDA approved or, or cleared. And more and more are coming through for everything from stroke rehabilitation and cardiac rehab to pain, anxiety. Uh, if you're interested, we have a website. It's virtualmedicine.org or virtualmedicine.health. And on that website, you can see all of our research. You can see videos of patients using VR. Uh, and we have a whole library of lectures that we from you know experts from around the world that come to our webinars and our meetings. We do have free webinars. The next one is coming up on the first week of December. We held a competition for the world's greatest VR clinical research, and we picked the top four, and they're going to be presenting that um, in a YouTube premiere event. It will be recorded. So you can check all that kind of stuff out there. There's a link to the book, uh, VRX which is how virtual therapeutics will revolutionize medicine. That book just came out a few weeks ago. And I, in that book, I really tell some of the stories we talked about today, 
And it's really more about what does VR teach us about our consciousness, about mind-body medicine, and really about the, you know, the, uh, where is neuroscience right now? You know, what, is it, what are the boundaries of what we know about consciousness and neuroscience? So it's about VR, but it's about a lot more than that. So those are just a few resources um, your listeners may be able to check out. And I would imagine you can get the book at Amazon and Target and Barnes and & Noble and wherever fine books are sold. That's right. Wherever books are sold, it's called VRX. So, you know, I always say if VR is a therapy, then we need a VR pharmacy. So that's why I called it VRX. Brendan Spiegel, VRX how virtual therapeutics will revolutionize medicine. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.